namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Theravada Buddhism series, Dhamma talk number 61, Predominance and Vipassana. <clears throat> In this talk, we are going to deal with the role of predominance a deep deep in the mindfulness insight at different phases of the meditation Let's see the walking meditation first. There, the yogi experience fire and wind elements as a series of upward movements with lightness. and water and wind elements as a series of downward movements with heaviness as you have been practicing you know what i'm talking about in here the elements the four elements or their manifestations are rupa materiality and knowing phenomenon or knowing process of those materiality is nama the mind Two different, two separate things, Nama and Rupa, consciousness and body. <clears throat> now let's look into sitting meditation, a little snapshot of it. While one is practicing sitting meditation, one will sense the rising and falling movements of the abdomen, the stomach area, whenever that movement is evident, one will notice, one will know. But when the movement signal is very faint, very subtle, one will not know, one will not notice. So, if there's a movement, one knows. If there is no movement, one cannot know. From there, you can understand movement is the cause and knowing is the effect. C 
cause and effect, cause our relationship. This distinction or sharpness of this causal relation is evident, very evident in the four postures. Four posture, standing, walking, sitting, and lying down. Those are the four postures. Causal relationships is very evident. Let's see. You are sitting. And before you stand, avoid getting up quickly. Close your eyes. Pause for a moment and observed. And if you do that, you will sense the intention of wanting to get up. You want to get up and if you got up quickly, you won't know anything. But pause a moment. Observe that moment and you will sense the intention to get up. Wanting to get up. And because of that intention, the wind elements generated in the body, and that wind elements pushes the body gradually upward and standing that's how one observes in the transitional stage from sitting to standing so focus the transitional movements and its associated quality okay bending propping pushing pressure stretching moving leaning heaviness lightness those are the associated qualities happening at that transitional movements. But don't focus on the form of the body. That's a key point. The form is a concept. All the qualities are reality. Specific characteristic. So let's carry on in. Put another one just to get sink into our brain. Now you are standing. Once one is standing, avoid taking a step quickly. Again, the same thing. Pause for a moment, take a moment and observe. And one will notice the intention of wanting to step. And due to that intention, the wind elements generated in the body or wind element arises and the movement of lifting the foot, pushing the foot, and dropping the foot occur. Lifting, pushing, dropping the objects that we observe in walking. Okay. 
That transition from standing to walking. Intention is the cause, movement is the effect. Causal relationship, very obvious. That's why we practice walking meditation so that that understanding can become an imprint in our psyche, in our brain. So carry out similar procedures for all transitions from one posture to another. And if you keep doing repeatedly that Pichiyaparigahanyana causal relationship between mind and matter will become obvious as an insight. So let's see this wanting to stand or you can say wanting to stand, intention to stand. What is that? Wanting to stand, intention to stand, intention, intending is the mind, chitta. So in this little patch, wanting to stand is the predominance mind, chitta. And also wanting, wanting is a desire, or you can say a wish, whichever word you like. Wanting is a desire or wish, predominance, noble witch, Chandadipati. Chandadipati is Chetasika, mental factors. Consciousness that knows. In that wanting to stand is the Chitta Deepati. So in this one little scenario, wanting to stand is, you can say both, predominance mind as well as predominance wish is in play. Physical movements and manners arising because of that wanting. Is mind made matter? Okay. Mind made matter, wanting. It's the mind. And also a desire, of course. And all the movements of the foot or the body and so on. These intimations are called mind made matter. So there are three things in play. One is the mind, one is the desire, and one is the mind made matter. They are operating all together at the same time. So, when we are practicing, we have to observe the cause, which is intention, and the effects, mind make matter. Okay. Intention and mind make matter, or cause and effect. So, this is how these predominance play in our observation and vipassana practice. When the yogi has insight, 
number one and number two. One is discriminative awareness of mind and matter. Two is causal relationship between mind and matter. When a yogi directly experiences these two inside, when it becomes your own personal understanding, personal wisdom, at that point, that person is relieved achieve a relief and also achieve a dependable foundation. A foundation is something you can stand on, but something dependable in one's life in the Buddha Sasana. You have a, a firm foundation to stand in the Buddha Sasana and you have some relief from a certain degree of suffering because of the understanding of the two insights. And that person is called Junior Stream Winner, Sula Sotapana. Okay. A Junior Stream Winner. And that person will not be reborn in the four woeful states in the next existence. In other words, that person is guaranteed that when one dies, will not be reborn in the hell rum or animal rum or hungry ghost rum or demonic rum. Those are the four woeful states. That is the benefit of attaining, experiencing the first two insight. And also, alternative views of deliverance cannot sway them anymore. Once you become a junior sotapanna, any other ideas, theories, philosophy, techniques of deliverance from suffering, regardless how good a speaker is, they won't be able to sway that person to change the mind. And if the yogi continues to practice with predominance effort, in other words, you put the effort at the head, at the hum, you can reach the insights of equanimity, which means you have to put lots of effort, and effort is the leader predominance. And if that's the case, you will surely reach the stage of equanimity. And then eventually to path wisdom, megat And that Part wisdom is we mansadipati. Predominance wisdom. Part wisdom is the predominance wisdom. So predominance wisdom comes along the way whenever you are achieving different insights, but it becomes right at the top. You have reached the top when you attain the path wisdom. And once you reach that, the first path wisdom, that person will never ever be reborn in the four woeful states. In other words, that person will never experience suffering 
that comes in those four woeful stay. You are free from those kind of suffering. But still, some will suffer it left. But those suffering in those four woeful state, you are free. So that's how predominance, a deepity, plays while we are practicing Vipassana. And let us look into a story. When I say story, it's a real event that happens during the time of the Buddha, always recorded in the scriptures, in some cases as a discourses, During the time of the Buddha, a man renounced earthly life and became a Buddhist monk. At the Jetta Grove Mo Monastery at Savuti Kingdom. When it is in the scripture, there's a, they mention about the approximate time the place, regional place, local place, very specific. And that monk, after learning the rules of a monk and also some meditation, for five years, he learned for five years. He went to the Buddha, then asked for contemplation of deliverance to practice in a forest. He decided he's ready to go alone into the forest and practice till he attained Nibbana. At that time, the monks always went to the Buddha and asked for a meditation technique. And the Buddha gave them, according to their personality and the effectiveness, a certain kind of meditation. Of course, they are all mindfulness and sight meditation. But certain people are more affected with a certain technique. And the Buddha knew. So he gave different monks or different groups a little different variation of mindfulness and sight meditation. The Buddha taught him how to observe the full posture, what we have just described at the beginning of a talk. And the monk thought practicing lying posture could slow him down in progress of Dharma. Because lying down is more prone to slop and torpor. So he wanted to avoid that. The only way to avoid is he has to practice without lying down, in other words, without sleeping. That much his determination is, his desire is. And that kind of practice is Vriya Deepati as the harm. Predominance effort, he put predominance effort as a leader to practice without sleeping. Even though they are full predominance, one is always taking charge at one time. Practicing without sleep exhausted him 
and he died of a stroke while practicing. And then monk, the monk became a dewa. But the funny thing is, he wasn't aware that he has died and he's not aware that he is a dewa now, not a human monk. Of course, once you got to the dewa realm, everything is instinct. Your residents are ready, foods ready, companies ready, musicians ready, all the female dew, if it is male female dewas ready. Everything is instinct because dewas are instant born. They don't have to grow up like us from a little fetus and then a baby and adult. So the female dewas approached him and welcome, welcome him. And when the female dewa approach, he knows that someone is approaching. So what he did was he adjusted because he has a dewa now, it is a dewa clothes, not the monk clothes. But he adjusted the dewa clothes as if it is a monk's robe. That's how he adjusted and kept his observation intact. In other words, people are approaching. So when people come, the monk has to be pr properly, has a proper attire. In other words, the ropes cannot be one falling up at the side or a part of the body shown, so that's what it means by adjusting. That's a customary thing, a modest thing to do for a monk when people are around. And when the female dewa saw that, they know this dewa must be a monk in the last life. So they try to talk sense to him. We have to tell him, you are dead from the human life. You have passed away and now you are in a Dewa Ram. Talk sense to him. However, words and voices could not distract him because he is his profound sense control. In other words, when you see, seeing, seeing. When you hear, simply hearing, hearing. Not the words, not the meaning, simply sounds. He's totally with the sense control. The observing mind of the late monk, who's a Dewa now, the observing of the mind of the late man extended into the Dewa's mind. Okay. That is that certain mind, observing mind, extended from the human to Dewa. And that is because of the Jigda Deepati predominance mind. When the mind is so strong, it carries a certain mental factor from one life to the other. Observation. And he became aware of the fact that he died and became a Dewa when the female Dewa put a mirror in front of him. When they put a mirror in front of him, he saw himself, not as a monk, but a Dewa. Only then he knew that he had passed away from the monk's light and became a Dewa. 
Now, as he fully realized and accepted the fact of this present existence of Dewa, his understanding and practice of Dhamma in human life has vanished, drowned by the pleasure of the Dewa Ram. That's what happened when we die. Okay, let's say one dies and become, let's assume, become another human being. But in a, a new human life, there's no awareness of what has been done in the past life with specificity. But the habits, the practice, wholesome karma, unwholesome karma, that energy is carried on. But the memory is wiped out, slick clean. So, he has a sense, he died, and then he is now Dewa, aware of that, but details. Not there, especially what the Buddha has taught him in his past life as a monk. Because the pleasure, pleasurable environment is so great in Dewaram and it is constantly happening. He was practicing to attain Nibbana as a monk and instead he achieved Dewaram. So he was disappointed and even demoralized. I was going to achieve Nibbana, but now it's just a Dewa. He felt repulsive with the joys of Dewa existence. Most people will be very happy in that realm, but because of his practice and his predominance mind and predominance effort, he felt repulsive about this Dewa existence. And also the beauty and the pleasure of the Dewa realm. He looked at them and it seemed like a, a morgue or a cemetery, totally unenjoyable. That's how he was feeling as a Dewa. So he went down to the Buddha, from Dewa Ram to the human realm. He went to the Buddha and told of his situation and asked the Buddha how he could escape this existence of Dewa and attain Nibbana. So in other words, he asked for the instruction how to, to escape and attain liberation. The Buddha gave the Dewa a Dhamma talk or Dhamma discourses. And that is a a discourse, a sutta by itself. But here we'll talk in a very brief manner. Okay, the Buddha said, the path of Satipatthana Vipassana will take one straight to Nibbana. If you practice Satipatthana Vipassana, mindfulness inside, it will take you straight to Nibbana. You are on the highway. And the Buddha gave analogy, but one must take a chariot fitted with two noiseless wheels very quiet wheels. The rails, very strong rails around the chariot. And there's a seat with a backrest. Okay, 
you must take the chariot fitted with two noiseless wheel all the rails and the walls and the seat and the backrest so that you won't flip over that's what Buddha said so the chariot is the Eightfold Noble Path. You must take Eightfold Noble Path. And the two silence we that is fitted is effort, Uriya. Physical effort and mental effort. Physical effort means keeping the body straight, head straight, posture good, walking meditation, properly done. Those are the physical effort. Mental observe is observing, observing every object that is arising at the present moment without fail. That's mental effort. Those are the two quiet wheels that's fitted to the chariot. And then the seat's backrest, what does it mean? It is moral shame and moral dread, hiri and uttapa. Shameful, always shameful to do unwholesome actions and always fearful and dreadful of the consequences of the unwholesome actions. Hiri and Dabba. It is also called Dhamma Pala, Loka Dhamma Pala, the guardian Dharma of the world. Hiri and Dabba. And the guard rails around the chariot is mindfulness, sati, sati guard, so that no mental defilements can come in. It guards, it shields, it protects from mental defilement, sati, mindfulness. That's the guard rails of the chariot. And the right view achieved through Vipassana practice, the right view, samadhiti. It clears the gross form of greed, anger, and delusion. Kilesa, gross kilesa are all wiped out. The right view can. That's the first phase only. And eventually, it will take you to path, fruition and nibbana. First of all, gross mental defilement, then medium, then very subtle one. And once they are all gone, one will attain path and fruition and nibbana. So there's one left, the chariot, the driver. Who is that? And it is explained that chariot is the path wisdom, not a person, not an individual, not a self. The chariot is the path wisdom. That is the a gist or the brief account of the discourse. It was a long discourse. At the end of the Buddha discourse, Deva contemplated and at once become a Sotapanna. 
Dewas are very bright, very intelligent, very smart. Many times smarter than human. And also, this Dewa has a parami. As a human, he practiced with predominance effort, predominant desire or wish, and had an unwavering mind, predominance. Mind, jitta, deeper deep. So all the foundations are there, right to the brim. So he just have to contemplate and understand it and became a sotapana, the first stream winner. And this human monk or dewa never lose sight of nibbana. The mind is focused, determined, unbending for Nibbāna. Path wisdom, that is the in Pali Vimansa Dipati. When you one attain path wisdom, that's the predominance wisdom at that moment predominance wisdom take over take charge and all other mental factors follows and the mind make material behave accordingly that's how one can see the full predominance play in the success of the Vipassana practice, mindfulness insight practice. May all of you be able to use the full predominance effectively, appropriately, and may you be able to attain at least the first dream winner state as soon as possible. Sadhu. Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you very much.